Broadcasting from the Tazan Lake Lodge Studio. This is Sporting Journal Radio. Presented by OnX. Know where you stand with OnX. Now here's your host, Brett Amundsen. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thank you for tuning in on this station right here by downloading the podcast wherever you get your favorite podcasts or uh, by listening on demand at sportingjournalradio.com. Thank you for watching this too on Facebook, YouTube, or wherever else you're watching it. Dan Amundsen is right over there. Hey, hey, what's going on? We got a great show for you this week, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really excited about this one. We got the Jasons on the show. That's Jason Durham and Jason Rylander. Uh, they've, been, they've been doing stuff together uh, quite a bit lately. It seems like they did a, a seminar together in Fargo recently. They did a cl- clam Facebook live on uh, on Wednesday night. So uh, w- we got them together for the show, and we're going to have a little bit of fun with them since they've been since they seem like the perfect couple, don't they, Dan? Well, they're uh, they're something. They're, <laughs> they're two dudes who <laughs> they're good friends. We'll put it that way. Yeah. So we're going to play. We're going to have a little bit of fun with them. And uh, I told them we're going to play some trivia. What I didn't tell them is that it's going to be the newlywed game. So we're going to play the newlywed game with the Jasons coming up uh, later in the program. And uh, we've also got Joe Henry with a fishing report. And we're, we'll get a fishing report from them, too. Up newlywed the games on the podcast exclusively. That's right. I almost forgot about that. So if you're listening to this on the radio show, you're not going to get to hear the newlywed game with the Jasons. But if you watch the podcast or download the podcast, you'll get bonus content that you won't hear here on uh, the the 30 station radio network sporting journal radio network um we'll also get some fishing reports and we're going to talk a lot about burbo i like to call him burbo the I've burbot heard that one before el burbo so we fish Ugh. in saskatchewan with uh, the savage burbot baits a lot the big uh, rubber baits and we always call them the el burbo we're going to tie what? on the el we're going to tie on the Elber Bow for some giant lake trout and pike. Uh, so we're going to talk about burbot and how popular they've become in recent years. And Dan, you've done a lot of fishing for eel pile lately. Like for me, they're more of a bycatch. I don't really target them too much. And I don't get mad when I catch them. Like normally I, I'm, I'm hoping it's a big giant walleye that I'm catching. And then you, they, they tug a little bit different. You start to realize it's it's not an, a walleye. It's going to be an eel pout. But they're fun to catch. They look cool. Uh, they're delicious to eat, even though most people now that are into catching eel pout generally practice catch and release with them. Um, but they're kind of fun to catch, aren't they? They're a blast. I mean, they're, you know, you say you get mad at uh, when they're when it's not a big walleye after February, whenever the walleye season closes, you're mad when it's a big walleye. Yeah. Cause you're sitting out there at midnight, you know, sitting there pounding bottom with your big three quarter ounce uh, jig with loaded with fat heads and you feel that thump and here's a walleye and you know, Oh no, it's still fun to catch, but man, those, those yeah, I'm okay fight like zeal would fight like no other. It's a, uh, it's a fun time. And typically it's a little bit warmer. You're sitting outside with friends. Uh, it's a good time. Oh. As they say, I mean, the tug is the drug, right? So a fisherman likes to, he's not going to get me mad about catching any fish. Really. Like it's fun to catch carp once in a while. If you're trying to, even though you might be trying to catch a walleye or something else, Man, because some of those rough fish, they 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 put up a pretty good fight. So eel powder, a lot of fun, and I wouldn't be surprised to see limits put on them and them essentially being considered a game fish in it's the coming. near future here in uh, in Minnesota. All right, so we're going to talk to the, the Jasons about eel pout. Well, I'm sure we'll talk to Joe Henry about eel pout, too, up at Lake of the Woods. We'll get a Lake of the Woods fishing report as well. Dan, who is this week's show brought to us by? Yeah, this week's show is brought to us by Haybell Heights Campground and Resort on Devil's Lake. Plan a trip to Devil's Lake at haybaleheights.com. Otter Tail Lakes Country. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. Lake of the Woods Tourism. Plan a trip to Lake of the Woods at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Tazan Lake Lodge. Plan a trip of a lifetime to catch giant lake trout and pike at tazanlake.com. OnX Hunt. Know where you stand with OnX. Mid-Migration Outfitters. Rent one of our guided fish houses or start thinking about spring snows in Minnesota. Visit midmigrationoutfitters.com. And Prairie Sportsman. Watch episodes anytime at Prairie Sportsman. Dot org. That is correct. And uh, our new season of Prairie Sportsman's coming up. We'll talk about that in just a second. But I've finally done it, Dan. I finally transitioned to fishing season. You did. I'm I'm not like Congratulations. Ah, everybody makes fun of me because I, I never really fish early ice because I'm too busy chasing pheasants or bow hunting, doing something like that. I'm not like the end of the hunting season is always a little bit depressing for me. It's very depressing. I'm not happy about it. Overall, I can't complain about this year. It was pretty good. Had a pretty good pheasant season. Actually, had a great 
deer hunting season, despite not shooting one, I did have some chances. I saw some nice deer. I saw a ton of deer. I hunted hard from the stand this year. And then till the bitter end, 11 below zero on the last day of the bow hunting season this year. Thankfully, I was a friend offered their enclosed blind that I got to sit in. I appreciate that. But it was it was still cold and I wasn't going to bring the heater. I brought the heater. Yeah. And I was dang glad I brought the heater because yeah. that last day, man, and I had to walk a good quarter mile back to my truck from the stand. And it was, it was 11 below air temperature, but it was blowing about 20, 25 miles an hour. So it was like walking directly into the wind back to the truck. Uh, I was hating life, but overall I can't complain. The waterfall season was, it was all right. I mean, it was okay. What'd you think of your fall it hunting was, season? Uh, fall overall was good. I will not complain about fall. A waterfall, like you said, which is what I spent most of my time doing. It yeah. was it was up and down. We had its, our bright moments. We had our our, our down moments for sure. We uh, we missed a lot of opportunities. Um, duck wise, I know that we'll hopefully capitalize on next year. Now that we've learned, the migration was a little strange. The drought didn't help us at all. Um, we're just seeing declining Canada goose numbers in our area where there's plenty of Canada geese around. I don't want yeah, to make that confused. They're not declining. They no, just, they're just, just not they're sticking not around sticking around in our yeah. area. Um, not like they used to. So that's not helping us out, especially come December. Uh, Mother Nature, the weather was not our friend. The forecasts, uh, sorry, uh, weather men and women, you were not right. <laughs> Hardly at all when we were supposed to have snowstorms or whatever. It, uh, we'd look forward to snow and we wouldn't get snow. We'd look forward to a cold front and it'd be warm. Just it. Just one of those years, and that's how it goes. So uh, we'll uh, look forward to next year in uh, March. We're looking forward to spring snows now. That migration was strange in the fact that opening day waterfowl season in Minnesota, so the end of September, yep. we shot specks in western Minnesota, which, granted, I think the speck po population, the white-fronted goose population is growing, and I think the migration routes are spreading a little bit more eastward. Sure. But to see them that early, and then... You know, we're big proponents of lengthening the duck season or going later in Minnesota for the duck season so we can shoot late season mallards. And we tend to get in arguments with people online about this because everybody's got their own opinion about the waterfall regulations. And that's good. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, somebody mentioned that because uh, we're we're OK with a longer split in October because we definitely have an October lull that first week or two in October. Once you hit opening day, you kind of pressure the locals a little bit. It's hot. I think it was 80 degrees during our split again this year. Last year, I think it was 90 degrees during our split here. And it's not good duck hunting weather. So we're okay with a longer split so we can hunt late season mallards. Like we saw mallards, big bunches of mallards after the season closed this year here in Western Minnesota. Now you have to be around open water. You have to be around one of the river systems. I understand that. But somebody said, well, we had an October push of mallards this year, which we did. There was a big population of mallards that moved down early this year. And then there was another lull and then more mallards came late season in November. But it was a weird, like, we normally don't see mallards like that in October and we had them this year. So the migration was, was a bit strange. Just put that anywhere. Yeah, that's right. The migration was a bit strange this year, but it is what it is. And you can't, uh, you can't always predict what mother nature and what wild critters are going to do. You just be out there as much as possible to increase your success and your odds. And uh, we went out there with a camera a whole lot this year, filming for this show right here, filming for some other YouTube shows that we do. And of course, filming for Prairie Sportsman. In fact, Dan, you filmed a little for Prey Sportsman this yeah, year. Yeah, I sure did. Oh, I'm way out of focus. There. Maybe we shouldn't let you do any well, filming. Uh, it's because I'm not behind the camera that it's going out of <laughs> focus. Right. Uh, yeah, I did. You uh, you let me stick around the crew a little bit and uh, it started kind of, I guess, at Lake of the Woods back in July, hmm. which that trip was just unbelievable on so many fronts. That's two episodes coming from that trip that are going to be very, very cool. Yeah. Um, it always helps to have a personal tie to, to one of them, especially in the other one. It uh, feels personal for just about everybody. Very cool stories coming up. Um, it was cool to go to the boat museum in Alexandria, see some right. very, very cool wooden boats. Legacy was, of the Lakes. Yeah, that was very, very neat. Um, and then the prairie. It, we got to spend an afternoon out on the prairie filming different flowers. And, and the fern holes. The fern holes of the prairie. Mm -hmm. and it sounds kind of weird, but for us who love upland hunting especially or pheasant hunting especially it's really really cool especially because that was end of august we filmed that so it was before most hunters typically jump into that prairie but uh, to kind of dive into the science and, and a little bit of what goes into that land that we like to hunt and what makes that land so good and so fruitful and why we need to protect it uh pretty cool stories coming up 
It's interesting to look at land that you spend so much time in in the fall. Yeah. You know, brown grasses or golden grasses or brown leaves or leaves falling off the trees to see what that prairie, what that landscape goes through throughout the year and how it changes. And that's one of these stories just talks about the evolution. Uh, I don't know if evolution is the right word, but the cycle, maybe the cycle is a better way to say it, the cycle of a prairie throughout the year and how it looks in various stages uh, as different plants come up and bloom throughout the year. Anyway, it's pretty cool. Here is a little sneak peek of season 13 of Prairie Sportsman coming up. The name's Bout, Helly Bout. Max often has a lot to say. Thank you again. This is amazing. Really enjoy going back to the prairie and seeing what's blooming. God planted the horse seed in me from infancy. So the new season of Prairie Sportsman will kick off Sunday night, January 23rd on Pioneer PBS. In fact, our first episode, uh, Dan and some of Dan's footage will be in that first episode too, filming some deer as we we went and visited someone who's basically bought some hunting land and then just constructed this wildlife paradise on it. We'll talk about what he did, why he did it that way, and what he would have done differently uh, coming up in that first episode. And he battled polio and how that's affected him over the years. It's a really neat story coming uh, January 23rd on Pioneer PBS. And then we're actually adding a couple of new states to our viewing area. So we're gonna be on in uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, North and South Dakota, Iowa. And then uh, we've got a couple new states that we're gonna be announcing. So I think Prairie Sportsman is gonna air something like 400 times around the region or something in the next year. So wow. the show airs a lot. <laughs> wow, that's right. Also on uh, YouTube, Facebook, uh, check us out, Prairie Sportsman uh, on Pioneer PBS. Well, as I said, we've transitioned over to the fishing side of things now from hunting. And uh, Dan and I have been out on the ice a little bit. Dan, what's your fishing report for us? Yeah, well, we've got plenty of ice out here in our location, Western Minnesota. Obviously, ice varies wherever you're at. Don't take my word uh, and, and take it to whatever lake you're trying to fish it varies very differently across the state but fishing's been good and uh, despite the cold fronts it's been good uh, guys been catching a lot of crappies uh, a lot of tungsten jigs minnow heads um, some rattling spoons small rattling spoons i'd say like 16 ounce don't go much bigger than that um, walleyes in the evenings rattle reels they seem to be liking the set lines bobbers rattle reels uh, a lot more than jigs uh, like it always helps to have a jig, a rattle, or some kind of vibration down there to help bring them in. Um, but a lot of times they're eating that rattle reel, and they seem to be eating real, real light. Um, we spent a lot of time out there uh, one night ago, and or a couple nights ago, and they'd take that thing down, and I would just let them suck on it. And it's like that's all they were doing, was sucking on it, playing with it. And you'd just go to pull it tight, and you'd pull it right out of their mouth. And, yeah. Uh, that's that. Uh, so they're a little finicky, like typical winter walleyes. They're, they're not, not always nice to play with, but pan fishing has been good. Perch, a lot mm. of perch been eaten too. Um, so it's a good time to get out there. And we've got trucks and tan, uh, half ton trucks and tandem axles in our area. But obviously, like I said, that varies where you're at. There's still some trucks going through uh, in places a lot further north than us, like uh, Brainerd, as we saw from Walleye Dan's post the other day. A um, couple trucks went through the other day on Gull. It's not a pretty sight. Yeah. Be careful out there. Stay on roads or go through. I know people like to do it on their own, but uh, that's the beauty of going through a guide service or an outfitter is they've generally uh, got great condition reports and they've got a good idea of what's going on out there on the lakes. And uh, we hope those people that are in those pictures are okay. Also, it's winter, and that means a couple of other unique things that you can place in the outdoors, including snow sculpting. And I want to congratulate an old friend of mine from Fargo, Jay Ray. He has uh, uh, Jay Ray Carves. He actually remodeled the house that I had in Fargo, redid the kitchen. That's one of the reasons we bought that house, because of the work that he did on that place. He's also an amazing artist. He does a lot of chainsaw carving, including bears and other wildlife. He did some really cool fish work, like this one right here. Um, he's also gotten into snow sculpting, and he was asked to help uh, represent North Dakota in the 27th annual U.S. Snow Sculpture Contest. It's going to be in Lake Geneva in Wisconsin coming up in February. Uh, this photo right here is from last year from the contest in Fargo-Moorhead. Uh, that's at the Yumcom Center there in Moorhead. Uh, and I'm sure it'll be part of that event. That event is coming up January 29th in Moorhead there. 
And, uh, and then he'll be in Wisconsin in February representing the U.S. snow sculpting team. So congrats, Jay. He does really nice work. Pretty awesome. All right. We got Joe Henry with a Lake of the Woods fishing report when we come back. And we got the Jasons, Jason Durham and Jason Rylander. A great interview. You don't want to miss it. It's coming up on Sporting Journal Radio. Looking for winter adventure? Might as well pick a place with over 1,000 lakes. Ottertail County, Minnesota is in the middle of everywhere, offers a simpler pace, and has something for everyone. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. Now it's time to head up to Lake of the Woods to check in with Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods Tourism to find out what's going on on that big lake. And uh, Joe, we shared something into the Sporting Journal Radio Insiders group the other day. It was uh, something from the Lake of the Woods Tourism page. You had you had gone up there and caught an eel pout and. Everybody, I, I feel like a lot of people like to cut those fish open and see what they're feeding on. And it's a great way to learn some knowledge to figure out what you should use, you know, as far as lures go next time you're up there. But you cut into one and found some some interesting stuff in there. Well, and the thing of it is, you know, I don't, I don't cut into every fish I catch. But in this case, the gut was so big. The stomach was so big. You knew there's something in there. And it's like, okay, what, what is this eel pout, you know, been eating? So I, uh, I cut it open. And what it was is there was actually a, a pretty darn good size uh, walleye in there. And on top of the walleye, there was a whole bunch of crayfish this eel pout was eating. I mean, this, this eel pout was eaten well. And uh, you can kind of see if you're watching the video portion of it right now where we pull it out. And, you know, that walleye, I mean, I don't know if it's a 10-inch walleye or what it is, but, I mean, pre- pretty good size uh, forage for that pout. Of course, it's a big pout, too, you know. How, how big was the pout? Do you remember? Oh, gosh. You know, I don't know, probably eight pounds. Okay. So I'm just trying to get a reference on how long, because he, he sometimes, I think people don't realize how big of forage some of these fish will eat. You know, some, even some smaller fish, they'll end up taking down some fish that are that are much bigger than you'd expect them to. Wait, well, no, Brett, so. I, I tried uh, I tried measuring that eel pout, and half of, after a half a day of trying to get it to straighten out for me, <laughs> I just thought I'd give up. <laughs> right, and crayfish. You know, I think uh, I think just about every fish feeds on them: smallmouth, walleyes, eel pout feeds on those. It doesn't seem like something that would be easy to like. It seems painful, like to eat a, a, a whole crayfish like that. It seems painful to me. Oh, I tell you, and fish, fish love them. In fact, I've caught uh, walleyes before that actually have little uh, little cuts on the top of their head from diving down into the rocks, nailing crayfish. So, yeah, no fish love them. In fact, <clears throat> there's times of the year where, you know, when you are, are fishing, you know, using your, your golden oranges, gold or orange, or your reds, or, you know, things like that for your colors is very... Uh, conducive because they are feeding on crayfish and um, I remember one time I was fishing a tournament and we were pulling spinners probably six boats in its tournament and there was one boat that was clearly out fishing the rest of us and you know talking to my they were friends of mine talking to them afterwards they had realized that there was a crayfish uh, deal going on there in the rocks and they had a, an orangish red spinner blade because uh, we were pulling spinners again and you know uh, that that was a ticket that caught two to one versus mm. uh, any other color well, when we were up at Lake of the Woods last summer, it was a it was a crayfish bite. The fish were all up on the rocks, and that's where we spent most of our time and did really well while we were up there. Um, Joe, you talk about wind. forage on Lake of the Woods, Brett. You know, um, I mean, you think so that that fish right there ate a ate a walleye, it ate crayfish. You know, somebody has had an underwater camera down in like thirty feet of water, and you know, uh, uh, Lake of the Woods normally is that stained water, which it is, but. The water had been a little bit clear, I think, because of the low flow, and you could actually see fairly well. And it amazed me the amount of life down there, just the different mm-hmm. kind of bugs and critters moving around on the bottom. No fish even, but just, just it's like an aquarium full of forage. And that's, of course, one of the reasons Lake of the Woods is so sustainable is that there's so much forage, so many different forms of forage. 
Lots of forage under the ice and some forage above the ice for humans once again this winter. There's a bar on the ice up there, Joe. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, part of that's uh, forage, part of that's hydration. and uh, <laughs> Probably more <laughs> hydration. <laughs> the Igloo Bar uh, on the ice, it goes out of Zippo Bay Resort and uh, it's out. So it's, uh, it's all set up, it's a thousand square feet. It's got two big screen TVs, it's got a full bar, it's got a partial hot menu. You can actually fish inside the bar. Uh, Brett, how many bartenders do you know have a fresh bucket of minnows behind the bar each and every day? <laughs> well, I've known a couple that had nothing to do with fishing, and you don't want to go to those bars. But it, <laughs> we went in there when we snowmobiled across the lake a couple years ago, Joe. We went in there and uh, checked that place out. It's got to be one of the most unique bars I've ever been in. Oh, it's incredible. You know, they, they put it out in two different pieces, and it's like an igloo, you know, and, and you can actually fish. they got rattle reels there, or you can bring in a rod and reel in. So you can have a drink, watch the wild game, fish it's real festive people come from all over the lake to go there of course a lot of people staying in sleepers and things at zippo bay will go there um, once in a while they'll even have a, a you know performer go in there and play some live music um it, it is cool it's funny i asked uh nick painovich is the owner of zippo bay resort and i asked they, they got little uh, igloo porta potties outside the igloo bar and they're heated and i said nick how come you uh, actually heat your porta potties you know normally you never see that he goes well, i'll tell you what happened he said the gals are giving me a hard time because those seats were so cold. So I started heating the women's and then, uh, you know, all the guys started using it. So then I had to heat them both. So <laughs> I thought that was kind of fun. And, you know, it is neat. I mean, to, to imagine that's that bar is about three miles out on the lake. And each and every year they'll catch 40 plus inch pipe. They'll catch some yeah. inch walleyes out of there. I mean, it's just it's just kind of a novelty, the fishing part of it, you know, but it's uh, people really enjoy going there. Could you imagine sitting there and like putting one of those guys that's putting in a shift, right? That you see at the bar that sits there for a couple of hours and he's just, you know, starting to one eye it a little bit. And he looks over and the guy next to him is just all of a sudden pull, pulling a 42 inch pike up out of the floor. <laughs> well, I tell you what, one of, one of the bartenders there, Jenny, you know, she uh, I think the first thing she probably does when she gets there, usually I think they open at noon. You know, one of the first things she does is puts a big sucker minnow down mm -hmm. and uh, she pulls numerous 40 plus inch pike, you know, each uh, each year out of there. And it's. I mean, it's just what they do. And I gotta tell you, when I asked Nick, I said, uh, I said, Nick, it gets pretty festive in there when somebody catches a fish. He says, huh, you should see what happens when somebody loses one. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some to that. When we went out and spent the night on the lake the other night uh, and may have had a beer or two, uh, mo most of us were just kind of sitting around, hanging out, you know, uh, solving the world's problems. And we had all rattle reels or dead sticks down. You know, and that's something just might as well be fishing while you're out there. But you can have a lot of success when you're not actually jigging those rods, I think, sometimes. I'll tell you, you know, well, you know, and we always say in Minnesota, you can use two lines. So you want to do that one, two punch. You jig one line and then you dead stick the other line. And, you know, that dead stick can be a, a key component to put more walleyes on the ice. You know, uh, a few things and you, you need to work the dead stick. You don't just put a, a minnow down under a bobber and just let it sit. And that's it. You, you, you got to work it. So what I mean by working it, Brad, is. Pay attention to what's going on in the fish house. You know, normally that uh, that golden area is six inches to a foot off the bottom. I know some anglers that'll put their their minnows three feet off the bottom and make those fish swim up for them. Mm. You know that sometimes that can be a triggering effect. Sometimes you use a, a shiner. Sometimes you use a fathead. Sometimes you use a small sucker. Sometimes you go to a small crappie minnow if it's a real neutral mode because of cold weather. Um, Sometimes, you know, I've, I've seen where people have used dead shiners and they're actually, they prefer the dead minnows over the live minnows. Sometimes when they hook a minnow, they'll hook it under the back dorsal. Sometimes they hook it in the lips. Sometimes they hook it down on the bottom of the minnow. So it's upside down and the minnow will constantly try to right itself. Uh, oftentimes you might use a small ice jig or a glow jig um, with your minnow. Um, gold, glow, your, your, you know, glow reds, things like that. And other times, just a plain hook will do well. A plain hook could be uh, just a plain red hook, or that could be a plain hook that's got that glow on it, like a glow white plain hook. Um, your sinker. Sometimes if you put your sinker real close to the minnow, that minnow can't move around as much. If you put your sinker higher up and have a bigger gap between your hook and your sinker, that minnow has more freedom to swim. So all those little nuances, you know, um, instead of using the bobber, Sometimes I'll take a, a rod with a real flexible tip and I'll just set my depth with either a bobber stop or just knowing where the depth is with my Vexlar. And I'll just watch that rod tip because sometimes you get real light biters that'll just pull that rod tip down a little bit 
almost like a spring bobber, not that sensitive, but you know what I mean? And I tell you what, there's times where it would be real hard to see that bobber move under those conditions. Sure. Well, I see there's an article with uh, with some of those tips on your website. People can find that there as well as more information about where to go at Lake of the Woods. What's that website, Joe? You know what? Hey, all the information is there, Brett. Check out lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Ice fishing season is here. This winter, plan a trip to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Not only will you have the chance to catch their legendary perch, but this year, Hay Bale Heights has been catching big walleye after big walleye. And they're doing it from a mobile, comfortable snow bear. No matter how cold it is outside, you're warm and toasty on the inside. Learn more and book a trip today at haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. I think it's a perch. Took line pretty good. Your technique is impeccable. Thank you. <laughs> I don't catch fish on rattle reels anymore. Well, it looks like you're not going to anymore today either. <laughs> Did you miss it? No. It dropped it. I didn't miss oh, it. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even set the hook. You got to set the hook to miss it. All right. Well, that would have been a great way to start the show if you actually caught a fish, but um, it was close enough. We got to hear the rattle reel go off, so we're going to we're gonna go with it anyway. The two Jasons with us right now, that's uh, Jason Durham and Jason Rylander. Guys, how's it going? Very good. Awesome. And you guys are actually in the same fish house. You're on two different cameras there, but you guys are fishing together right now. Um, you know, which, which begs the question, a lot of people are wondering right now if you, Jason, has popped the question yet. Um, no, I haven't asked him for a beer yet. <laughs> I didn't know what question you were getting at. Is that the question? I thought maybe you pre something. Uh, you guys obviously are being seen together a lot in a lot of, a lot of different places. Uh, the Jasons is becoming a thing, I think, it seems like. Anyway, how did, um, how did you guys get to become friends? <laughs> Do you want to answer? <laughs> the internet. <laughs> it matched on Tinder or? <laughs> <laughs> no. We, uh, we, we knew of each other. We knew of each other on Facebook and we had followed, you know, what escapades we were each doing. And he invited me to go out eel pout fishing. I honestly wasn't really interested. I, I didn't want to do it. And he, he kept begging and when we went out the first time, we just connected on so many different levels and we had a great night catching burbs. And I was addicted to eel pout ever since then. And uh, I don't want to say we've been addicted to each other, but we spent some time <laughs> together. And, uh, well, and, and obviously, uh, eel pout or, or burbot are going to be a big part of this conversation. And we'll get, we'll get to that particular species of fish here in just a little bit, but let's just uh, back up for just a second. Now, uh, Jason Durham, of course, you've been on the show uh, a few times. You're, you're a teacher, uh, Jason Riley. I'm going to call you, what do I call you? Call you JD and JR or J1, J2. How's this going to work? Yeah. I'll, let me tell you what you can call him. There's a few things. <laughs> you can call him J Rye. You could also call him the Reverend. Because the Reverend? A lot of people do, yeah, a lot of people don't realize this, but Jason is an ordained minister. I know that may shock a lot of people, but he's available to host weddings, uh, you know, puts the fun back in funeral, um, <laughs> you know, anything like that. He's available. <laughs> uh, did you, are you, uh, did you get ordained? Are you like uh, the online church ordination that you have to do every year? Have you kept up with it? Uh, no, mine was a, a life, lifelong deal. You have to renew your local piece. Oh, that's what I it is. To, yeah. Yeah. And I never, I've never had to do that. I had a couple of weddings lined up a couple summers ago. I had a runaway groom. Oh, <laughs> 
Oh boy. <laughs> and, then, you know, and then I was going to do another friends and they got antsy and went to the courthouse and I never ended up doing theirs, but I am lined up for one this fall. So I'm excited to okay. uh, help out some friends there down on Leech Lake. Well, I kind of want to ask about the runaway groom, but based on that look, maybe we shouldn't ask for that story. <laughs> That's probably not good. Okay, so uh, Jason Durham, you've been on the show, of, of course, before, and um, you're a teacher. We know that. Uh, Jay Rye, we, I, think this is, I think this is your first time on the show, isn't it? It is. It is. Right, Thanks well, for having me on the program. <laughs> you bet. So we, we, we didn't really know what, what you did, so we did a little bit of research on you. We found out a, a few things about you. Um, you like PBRs, you hate shirts, <laughs> and you have a healthy obsession with bourbon. Is that accurate? Uh, well, the Paps thing has kind of come and gone. I played that card. I, I still do enjoy it, but I got, I come down with gout so bad I hardly drink beer anymore. Gotcha. And I haven't that- been able to get Royal to wrap my boat. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to ask. Was that because I saw a um, uh, Neil Paul picture with a can of PBR? Obviously, the boat, you had the boat wrapped. I remember when yep. that went up for sale a couple of years ago. That was going all over the internet. That was a big deal. And I always wanted to ask you how that came about. Was that a deal with, with actually with Pabst, or did Were you just a fan and said, I'm going to wrap my boat with that? Or how did that come about? I, uh, I met the regional sales manager and for whatever reason we hit it off. He liked me and I kind of just jokingly said one, we, we chatted multiple times and one of the times I was like, yeah, we should wrap my boat and be free advertising for you up here in Northern Minnesota. And he's like, that's a great idea. Eight months later, he called me, he goes, still want to wrap the boat. I found somebody to do it. Here's a couple of options and uh, the rest is history. I had a Paps boat, the Paps can we called it. You know, the thing about a rap boat is they're, they're pretty cool, but all of a sudden people quickly find out where you fish all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I didn't, I didn't mind. None of my spots are very secret anyway. Sure. How many guys came up and asked you for a beer? Uh, a few asked for a beer. A lot of pictures at the uh, boat landings, though. Lots of pictures. Guys wanted pictures with the boat. So it was, uh, I was always popular at the landing more than on the, on the water. I don't think people paid quite as much attention there. Sure. How, how did the family like your Christmas card this year? Um, <laughs> I know my wife didn't like it and my mom didn't <laughs> like it. <laughs> That's so awesome. My mother is, my mother is a saint and, uh, my brother, we were taking, an actual picture. It was over Thanksgiving and my brother's like, we should do one of those awkward Christmas cards. You got that long goofy hair. You can put it down and then uh, take your shirt off or something. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So we, so we did as a joke. I knew I had to get it on the internet before he put it on there. So the funny thing is we're sitting at Christmas and both put it on, put it on Facebook at the same time. That's great. The Christmas card picture was awesome, but I think the best one though is the Burbot Bath picture. Oh yeah, that's a that drummed up a lot of attention. That took that. <laughs> now Dude. that look on your face is that of pure enjoyment or uh, shock of cold water, or just the the fact that you've got all these eel pouts squirming around uh, <clears throat> your undercarriage? <laughs> Have you ever dipped your most sensitive body parts in 32.1 <laughs> degree water? That's the look on your face when you do that. It wasn't, I couldn't even feel those yelp out. Man. I was what? probably going to come on my lap and it was so dang cold. I would like to interject here for a second. Uh, you know, I had the same look on my face when he got out of that. If you Google <laughs> yelp out hot tub. Anybody can find it online. And it's not obviously a hot tub, but when he got out of that hot tub, I had the same look on my face because he had the most well-worn pair of underwear I've ever seen in my life. (laughs) There were so many holes in them. I I couldn't believe it. You were not getting any extra warmth from the one garment you had on. No, I wasn't. Oh, man. (laughs) I think the best part about that picture, a little funny story for me, is one of my first Photoshop projects in, in college, 
Uh, Jason, you're supposed to come up with the Bemidji State Fishing Team is doing an ice fishing gala uh, a couple years back. And so I had to make a poster for it. And so what did I use was that picture. Um, and where did, we, we slapped those things all over Bemidji State's campus. So I'm sure half of the, the, the people who weren't fishing were just walking around the hallways of Bemidji State wondering what the heck the fishing team is up to. <laughs> That's why those college point. girls were calling me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just it. <laughs> his underwear wasn't well worn. It was He was just trying to keep his underwear on. All these college girls kept trying to rip it off. Uh, wh- how, did that, how did that picture come about? Was that planned, or did you just say, I'm jumping in there? It looks comfortable. Yeah. So that was a picture I wanted to take that. I wanted to do that for a while. I had this idea in my head. Uh, the idea in my head was me more in with the fish and the fish kind of over my legs and in my lap but the when we went out and drilled the live well the ice was so porous immediately water started coming up so it every hole was a different deal it was jagged when i plopped my butt down in there my butt went right onto a chunk of ice and <laughs> wasn't super comfortable so getting my legs in wasn't an option uh but we we did the best we could with what we had and uh I guess the rest is history. Now, those are probably the the more famous pictures that we've come across. Are there any others out there that we should be aware of? Now, there's pictures out there. They just haven't been quite as popularized yet. Maybe some that haven't been shared, but they're all pretty PG. I mean, everybody everybody asked how, how drunk I was when I took the picture with the eel pout and this and that. And I said, actually, I was... I was completely sober because if I had drank that evening, I would have done it naked and then I wouldn't have been able to share that picture with the world. <laughs> oh, man. That, you know, when I see posts from either one of you two come across social media, it, it usually gives me a good laugh. There's props involved a lot of times or bourbon and sensitive areas. What I mean, do you guys try to outdo each other with some of these things? Are you guys collaborating? Is it, uh, you know, like, yeah, the wig picture? What, did you guys say, hey, let's, let's put on some... <laughs> <laughs> that was Jason. But that was, was it? That was Halloween. Halloween, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So we were just Halloween. And I mean, who doesn't have a couple extra wigs yeah. laying around the house? <laughs> if, <laughs> most of the ideas come from the school teacher not from the rice guy um <laughs> well I would, it's like you know i would say that <laughs> are you raising your hand there do you have a question, have a question. <laughs> things that are laying on uh, the table here in his fish house you know yeah. i the big thing for me is that um you know out of out of any feeling that you can have in your body laughter is one of the absolute best and it's contagious and it's eternal. Like if you think of something, if you think of the stupid things that we've done over the years and you go back and reflect on it, you're gonna laugh. You just are, and it feels good to do that. So, you know, to give people some joy in their life, a smile on their face, there's nothing better than that. And and we are really good (laughs) at making fun of each other. I love to prank Jason. I love to prank him. we've, We've had so many times and I, sometimes wonder if he just feels like he's stepping you know going through a minefield and like what's gonna <laughs> what's what's the best prank <laughs> what's the show rated <laughs> <laughs> oh i don't know we uh we had a pretty good one last summer where uh i called up a radio station in in bemidji that that we both do interviews with periodically and I said, I want to be a guest host and I want to interview Jason. Uh, but I pretended that I was somebody else, an intern, and uh, he <laughs> bit hook, line, and sinker. I mean, I, I talked about catching big eyed bass and small eyed bass, and he didn't even flinch. And <laughs> I, asked him, I asked him who his favorite out of any Jason in the fishing industry, who he'd want to fish with. And uh, he, Who did he, finally he, say? Got, he finally said me and I said, well, how much do you pay him to take you out? <laughs> and he still didn't catch on. He said, oh, I give him some Diet Coke and some hard boiled eggs. And then I broke character and said, well, you should pay me a lot more for putting out the brand. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, they got him and Kev Jackson got me good. 
They got. <laughs> then what? What threw me off with that prank? And maybe Jason will do the voice if he can remember what it was. But it was. Kevin texted me in the morning. He's like, hey, I can't do the interview with you today. I've got an intern in here. He's going to do it. Doesn't know a lot about fishing, but I got the question set up for him. And I'm like, okay, yeah, what? whatever. Whatever works for you, Kevin. Don't matter. By the way, I composed that text, sent it to Kevin, and Kevin <laughs> sent it to Jason. Brilliant. Premeditated. Uh, <laughs> so the phone rings, and I start doing it. And it is a quasi-Southern accent. <laughs> but he talked so slow that it threw me off because I didn't know how to really respond. Because so many Bemidji radio guys have Southern accents. I, like in the moment, what do you do? Like I had no reason not to believe. Everybody that heard it said, Jason, how didn't you know right away? Like, Everybody said, as soon as I heard the voice, I knew it was Jason Durham. As soon as I heard it, and I go, no, you didn't. You only knew it was me because you knew it was me. Otherwise, it, it, I mean, it's pretty good. It's a pretty good accent. <laughs> <laughs> it so was, did you get your better ones? Did you get them back? No, I'm a nice, nice human being. I would never do anything <laughs> like never, that. He never does that. He never, he, he makes fun of me sometimes. Yeah. But, but he doesn't like... And, and anything that we do to each other is never, like, mean, sure. you know, for the most part. I mean, I make fun of his weight. He makes fun that I'm going bald and that I'm older than him. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, it's you know, it's pretty kind. Kid loves. And I can lose the weight. You can't get younger or get hair. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the picture with the wig? <laughs> <laughs> That's why he has all the wigs, obviously. There's yeah. options. I always like yeah. to have options. He's, yeah. It's not um, the only wig you've got. And you, yeah, you should pair one of those wigs. I, well, I want to know, you know, obviously you guys both do stuff with Clam. Did Clam make that shiny jacket specially for you? And then did they give you the gold pants or did you just have the gold pants already? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. I Clam had nothing to do with it. I, I took care of all of this. Uh, we've got a great little embroidery shop outside of Nevis, the metropolis of Nevis, where I teach. Uh, Unknown Legends Designs, and they took care of it. Clam sent me the logo and everything. They had no idea what I was doing. Uh, the gold pants, you know, you can get anything you want off Amazon. <laughs> now, what's hard to see in the picture is uh, the hat is a LED hat, so you can put whatever you want going across the front of it. Oh, really? And the, shoe, and the shoes are actually fiber optic, so they light up. <laughs> when I was walking down Kellogg Avenue down at the St. Paul Show, Every single person was commenting or, you know, looking. I mean, you wouldn't believe the rubbernecking going on. And, you know, why would I do something like that? Not necessarily, not, not to get attention for myself, even though a lot of people would go, oh, you're trying to get attention. It's trying to give somebody a smile, a laugh. Like I told someone, when you go to Disneyland, you want to see magic. When you go to the St. Paul Ice Show, the biggest ice show on the planet, you want to see magic. Mm -hmm. And that's why I did it. Were you doing There's, magic tricks too? Card tricks? I was just emanating that. <laughs> just emanating the magic. <laughs> so dance, there, was, there was a little dancing. There was some you, dancing. Wear an outfit like that. We're losing you there a little bit. You have to. Are you? Yep. Can we you get guys there? Yeah. 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 All right. You were cutting out on us there. So um, I think we got you back now. But uh, oh. last thing we heard is that there can one, is that, can one of you guys silence your phone or? Uh, I. It's my ding. E I'm still working. The emails are popping up. I just shut uh, it. We should be good. All right. <clears throat> all right. We're still rolling, right? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So you guys are both obviously good at catching fish. You do some guiding, and I want to I want to talk about that and get a fishing report from you guys here in a little bit. But first, we're gonna do a little bit of trivia. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yes. Are you guys excited? I know when I told you guys before the interview that we we're going to do some trivia, uh, Jason Durham, you were very excited about it. Jason Ryland, not so much. But uh, 
He said he's really good at trivia. And I just said I've got really good pen, penmanship. Penmanship. So we need some props here. You need to be able to write something down. And uh, I know you guys are sitting next to each other, but you can't show each other your answers, okay? Okay. So grab your, your markers and your pieces of paper, whatever it is that you got there, notebooks, whiteboards, whatever it is. And, you know, <laughs> Dan and I talked about this, like what kind of trivia should we play? And we talked about maybe family feud or who wants to be a millionaire. Yeah. Something like yeah. that. But, but we figured we got the Jasons. So we thought the best game to play would be the newlywed game. Ladies and gentlemen, the newlywed game. With the Jasons here on today's show, <laughs> here's, here's how it works. We're going to have three rounds of questions. Bring that music bed yeah. down just a little, would you, Dan? We're going to have three rounds of questions. You'll each write down your answer, and then you'll reveal what each person guessed. And uh, if you get them all right, Dan, tell them what they're playing for today, ladies and gentlemen. They are playing for a custom <laughs> SJR 20-ounce his and his coffee mug. Hey, look at that. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like that. Yeah. I need that in my life. Yeah, I'll buy it if we don't win. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, are you guys ready for round one? Round one of the yeah, newlywed game. Know with the, with, the, with the Jasons. Hey, you guys know how this works, right? You want to know how well you know your spot, you know your fishing partner? The newlywed game? All right, so round one. This is about the two of you together. Question one, where did you guys share your first ca catch? Where did you guys share your first catch? Now, wait a second, wait a second. Now we gotta reveal lakes? I know, that's the big problem. Oh, okay. okay. Let's do this. How about first species? Just tell me the first species that you guys caught together. You don't have to tell, you don't have to tell me the lake. You That's can tell fine. me the lake. Yeah. You can tell us off the air. The first fish. Man can probably guess what lake. Playing the new lake game. You might be overestimating me. <laughs> <laughs> do we have our answers? I'm, I'm, I'm like, ready. How long? How big? How long is this name of fish, Jason? We're writing a novel it's over there about it. Right. All right, reveal your answers, ladies and gentlemen. And it's Burbot. They have one correct. Question one. I got it correct. All right, question two. Burpout. 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 <laughs> yes, the burp. The, the wily burpout. Jason, to wipe it off. This is the newlywed game with the Jasons. Who is better in <clears throat> who is better in boats? Who is better in boats, ladies and gentlemen? Boat control? No, just in boats. In boats. It could be boat control, it could be a better angler, it could be quieter, it could be more helpful. Could we better storyteller? And the answer is, ladies and gentlemen, reveal your answers. Me. He is. Hey, hey. they got it right. All right. <laughs> All right. I fully expected you to write me. me. <laughs> All right. We, we got 12 of these to get to. All right. Here's number three. Oh, okay. Who is yeah. most likely to be late to the landing? Who's most likely to be late to the landing? <laughs> writing a novel? I got it. <laughs> All right, reveal your answers. Me. Me. <laughs> well, I mean, they, it's they the right. The they the the hey, wait a second. Wait a second. What? That is a point for us. I mean, you both yeah. wrote the same answer. I'll allow it. Well, all right. I'll allow it. We both even had an exclamation point. Yeah, that is yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Question four. Who spends the most money on fishing gear? Who spends the most money on fishing gear? Playing the newlywed game with the Jasons. And we have it. All right. What are your answers? Me. Durham. Hey. They're four for four. 
Uh, All right, so round two. Married. Round two. <laughs> Round two is going to be a little bit different. This one will focus on Jason Rylander. So now we need to know how well Jason Durham knows Jason Rylander. Are you guys ready for round two? Here we go. Yes. What is J Rye's favorite colored jig? I mean, are you writing in calligraphy over there? <laughs> he bought paper and like a pen that doesn't work. <laughs> All right, what are your answers? Green glow, blue. Oh, you lost the lot. Glow gri- oh, wait. Oh, glow green. Oh, oh he, I think he's got it right. He changed his answer. There we go. All right. Now, was that after the sly oh, look I over? <laughs> I told him cheating was allowed, oh, so right. not a big deal. All right. <laughs> question, <laughs> question two. What is uh, Jay Rye's favorite boat snack? What is his favorite boat snack? Well, I got to think about this. This is a tough one, bro. My goal was to stump you. I think you might have. Are you guys big boat oh. snack guys? I know some I people. Eat it. <laughs> Jason does. I usually have to. I just eat whatever he's got. That's yeah. true. That's what it's hard for him because I just eat his food. I yeah, rarely I bring s- snacks when I hunt or fish, but I know some people that are very serious about it. Yeah. It's, I'm All very right. passionate about it. <laughs> All right. What are your answers? Cheese, coffee. Fried cheese. Oh, my God. It was the best boat snack I've ever had. Fried, he fried cheese in the boat. It was snowing out and we were frying cheese. It was amazing. Fry, how did you fry the cheese in the boat? How did that work? I have a little butane burner, a single burner, and uh, my boat's got enough space that yeah, I just set up a little kitchen in the back. <laughs> and fried some cheese. Yeah. yeah. It was like a brick. It was amazing. It's called bread cheese. You should look it up. It's incredible. Yeah. You really had it one time in your life. Yeah, it was okay. that good. <laughs> it's the most right. nicest thing you've ever done for me. I went with the cheese that you eat more than once. This is life that you're the They start fighting. I'm going to fight you after. <laughs> that was the goal. Question three. What is Jason Ryletter's dream fishing destination? What is his dream fishing destination, ladies and gentlemen? The Newlywood Game with the Jasons. Got it. Durham has his answer. All right, reveal your answers. Diefenbaker, Panama. Hmm. Well, you've already been there. Hey, I want to go back. <laughs> like you've already come. I live the dream, and I want to dream it again. <laughs> All right, one last question okay. around round two, ladies and gentlemen. The newlywed again with the Jasons. Who would play Jason Rylander in a movie, ladies and ladies and gentlemen? Who would? That's who would easy. play? I kind of feel like we might have this one too. It's who he's going to say, but it's not who I want. Good <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing fast. I'm a non-teacher. Okay, we got it. It's a long name. <laughs> yeah. All right, reveal your answers. Zach Galvanak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or Ron from Parks and Rec. Yes, Ron Swanson. No, 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 no. Or it's plus. Or. If those two could have a baby together, it would be Jason Rylander. <laughs> I look, Although you look a lot like Russell Crowe in that headshot. Right. Well, yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> So we kind of figured it'd be Zach Galifianakis, actually, and Dan did some Photoshop work there. He actually oh, photoshop- that's a real picture. He photoshopped, great, great. Photoshopped, great photoshopped your face on Hillary Clinton's body, I guess. 
Apparently. We got the same kind of body. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, one more round of the Newlywood game with the Jasons here. Round three. This is all about Jason Durham. How much does Jason Rylander know about Jason Durham, ladies and gentlemen? Question number one, what does Jason Durham say most often when he hooks into a fish? Ladies and gentlemen, what does Jason Durham say most often when he hooks into a fish? Hmm. You're already done writing? No, I'm wrong. (laughs) (laughs) I have a lot of practice at it. I practice writing every day. All right. All right, reveal your answers. There's one. This is awesome. <laughs> There's one. They got it. All right. Round, <laughs> round four going well. Question two. What is Jason Durham's go-to presentation for walleyes? What is his go-to for walleyes? The new summer or winter? Day. Let's go summer. Okay. Summer. We probably should have done winter since it, it is, is January. Winter, but yeah. <laughs> we like to think of summer. Yeah. More options. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about winter walleye fishing here in a little bit. All right, reveal your answers, ladies and gentlemen. Live bait rig. And that counts. Rig and crawler. There we go. All right. All right, question three, round four. What is Jason Durham's dream fishing boat? What is his dream fishing boat? That's easy. Super easy. You think he's fishing in it? Yeah, he probably is. Uh, maybe, um, yeah, well, Too late. all right. <laughs> <laughs> the one. <laughs> yeah, there it is. What? He has it. There it is. The one he has. All right. And the last question, ladies and gentlemen, last question of the Dooleywood game with the Jasons. What is Jason Durham's worst annoying habit? What is his worst annoying habit? That's a real Newlywed game question. We thought we'd put one real one in there. Loaded question. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Will they still be in the same ice house after this question? (laughs) <laughs> May have ruined uh, the live event that I ate tonight. Yeah, the Clam Live Facebook Sorry. event's been canceled. We've gone through everything now. And the answers are egg farts. <laughs> oh, they got it right. Hey, nice job. You guys can stay married. Congratulations. The Jasons for, for playing the newlywed game today. We're going to get you the matching set of his and his custom Sporting Journal Radio 20 ounce tumblers featuring this picture right here. Congratulations, fellas. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you have a supplier? I do, as a matter of fact. I'm going to want to order. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, we'll get you some. No problem. Uh, Thanks, guys. All right, I want to talk eel powder burbot now here with you guys as we continue this uh, this show. Now, I I think they're really cool fish, and I remember not that long ago that people were were still freaking out about them. Oh, they wrap around your arm when you pull them up. They're throwing them out on the ice, letting them die. Uh, Rough fish, they hate them. They're ugly, whatever. But in recent years... They become obviously much more popular. The, the popularity really is exploding for these things. People are, are guiding for them. People are fit, targeting them out there. Dan's been out there on the ice chasing them around quite a bit. Um, yes, in, in recent, with, with, that, with so much of that discussion, uh, they, they've gotten so popular that discussion about having limits on them in Minnesota has begun. Um, Jason Rylander, when did you first become interested and really start start to like that fish? I want to say 15 years ago or so was before my son was born, before I was married. I was out on Lake Bemidji fishing with some buddies. We we're walleye fishing and I caught one jigging and it was a six, seven, eight pounder. It was a big one. And I was like, that was incredibly fun. It fought harder than a walleye. And I want to know more about these. So I started doing a little bit of research, go back out on Bemidji, fishing in 
in March, I think it was early March, and I run into Matt Brewer, and that's how him and I met. Oh, okay. We struck up conversations, started fishing eel pout together, became friends. Now I'm guiding for him, and I took everything that he would share with me, and he got me in with the big nasty spoons. He know about. He knew Adam before anybody else would. Heck, Adam was hardly even selling them at that point, and. And then I just took it to a whole nother level. I, I really got into it and started exploring lakes and asking anybody I could, like, have you ever caught, like, where have you been catching eel pout when you're walleye fishing and this and that? And they're like, oh, what do you? everybody shared information because nobody cared. And right. you know, now I've got to know like, Tim Humphrey over there on Cass Lake's been guiding him for forever. He's been a great resource of knowledge and, you know, just soaking things in like a sponge reading any article I can find researching just the species in general and some of their habits and what they do and a whole lot of trial and error and a whole lot of gas money. <laughs> and it's, it was a fun adventure. I mean, it, I still enjoy the hunt and going out and trying different lakes, but it's always the big, everybody likes big fish. So I'm always going after yeah. big fish. So there's a lot of local lakes that I'm not necessarily fishing a ton anymore spending some time traveling and, and probably fishing them less than I used to, especially with how uh, life happens. You get older, you got kids and a wife and a job. So I don't get to do them quite, don't do, chase them quite as much as I used to. But I mean, what a fun experience pioneering and just learning something completely on your own. It's, there wasn't articles, there wasn't episodes on TV about eel pout. It was go figure it out. And it was yeah. an incredible experience. And I got to, and I got to do a lot of it with with this guy. Yeah, it still is an incredible experience. I mean, and it still is pioneering. You know, we got to help the DNR out with a, a study on eel pout that you know really they had no information on the species. And when we say we got to help out, it wasn't like we were wearing lab coats or anything, but we got to catch the fish and help catch the fish and watch the whole process. And there were other anglers that got to do that too. And then. Um, you know, just talking with other anglers too about the importance of that fish. Like a lot of people don't realize their role in the ecosystem. People think of them as this, you know, swampy, shallow water creature. They compare it to a dogfish okay, yeah. because they have a lot of physical similarities. And in reality, you'll have very stringent clean water requirements. So if you would have a decline in water quality, that would be the first species that's affected. So as a landowner or as a conservationist, you know, as an outdoors person, wouldn't you want to know if you were seeing that type of decline? So those types of studies, when, when we were helping out with the study, it was a, a pretty sizable chunk of money that was dedicated towards studying eel pollen. And when I would tell people about it, some people would, you know, be upset. Oh, there you go. There's another example of the DNR wasting our taxpayer dollars on this mm -hmm. junk fish. But it's not. It's an important species. And now you're starting to see this shift in, in how people are treating the fish and how they're respecting the fish and seeing it as something that's fun to catch, good to eat. Although even that part has changed where yeah. people are being, you know, very uh, much more conservation minded in how many they keep because it's not just this endless resource. I was surprised at how much catch and release has really taken off for that fish because they are good to eat and they weren't, you know, there's no limits on them in Minnesota. They, they weren't rega regarded as much of a game fish for a long time, but the, the sport fishing aspect has really taken off. And I know I would have conversations with Dan when he was up in Bemidji going to school up there and they'd be targeting these fish. He I'd, I'd be like, man, did you, did you cook some of those up? You know, it's, they're, they're good to eat. And he goes, no, we we always put them back. I don't think you guys really ever kept any, did you? I think you? I ate one. Yeah. Which, I, and I ate it and it was good, and, but I felt the need to not ever do it again because it's fun to watch them swim back. Well, of course, and I'm, I'm a big promoter, proponent of catch and release, there's no doubt, but I also love to eat fish. So, um, you know, I, I have no problem, like say walleyes going from six down to four. I have no problem with that, or even going down to three really for that matter. I, I, you know, you keep a couple, I don't 
I don't like to free. I usually eat it before it makes it to the freezer. So I don't feel the need to go out and have to catch a limit all the time. Um, so I, I'm, a, and for some of the trophy fish, like when I go up to Saskatchewan, all our big fish, of course, always go back, uh, or for that matter, any big fish that I catch anywhere always goes back. So I'm, I'm a proponent of that, but I'm, I've been surprised at how much catch and release is, has been involved with, uh, with the old pout guys. I think there's, there's anglers that are keeping some for a meal and, with any fish, heck yeah, have at it. There's, I mean, there is no limit. And that, that's the one thing that makes me nervous is it's getting more popular. The best time to fish them is pre-spawn and spawn. So, you know, there's, there's that ethical piece of it too. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with keeping a couple of those three to five pounders and taking those back straps in the tail and, and eating them. On a normal year, I might catch 300 eel pout. Let's just make up a number. Uh, I, I keep and clean four a year, probably, one meal. Mm. What? Most of the time, I'm not getting <laughs> home until 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. This is all cheese, and <laughs> that's what I'm getting. Um, um, looking at you, it's way more than four well, years. I think pout. fish is healthy. <laughs> I probably don't eat enough fish. So do you guys think that they should be putting limits on, uh, yeah. on those, on, on eel pout Minnesota? I've been working with the DNR on that through my connections at Lender Media, Jeremy Smith and Ty Shadeen. Um, and I've been involved in several emails, surveys, questionnaires. I had one phone call with, I didn't even know who the person was. I just kind of asking me questions. And so I've been doing my part and I know it's coming. Yeah. I think it's, but it's not an, they, you don't just flip a switch. I mean, I, I think it's got to go through legislature. I don't even think the DNR, I think all the DNR does is recommend the legislature and legislature who is who sets that stuff. I mean, cause it's a law. So there's a, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. And the other species in the conversation uh, was uh, Tulabi, Cisco. Mm, yeah. We're talking about putting limits on those too, yeah. because they're the popularity and, and with, with Cisco numbers depleting in some certain lakes, uh, yeah, they want to start protecting those as well. And they're those are good to eat too, and uh, surprisingly good to eat. I think a lot of people don't realize that just how good table fare they can be, and also fun to catch too. And I've seen people in recent years start to guide for for tulipy and and even whitefish too, uh, kind of a different species to target out there. Uh, spawn balls have to be one of the more unique events in nature here in Minnesota, don't you think? Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, what a unique thing. And even just to have a fish that spawns underneath the ice is very unique in itself. So the whole species is just, I mean, if, if you look at it, it's so dynamic. It's so wild. It's the only freshwater member of the cod family. Yep. Yeah. yeah they're, I've been able to watch a few spawn balls. I mean, some internet videos where they got them actually on video. But uh, I got I don't own one. And as I... We noted in the newlywed game, I don't spend money on fishing stuff, so I don't have a lot of scope. But uh, my friends do, and we were able, I was able to watch some spawn balls on live scope, which was pretty awesome oh, to wow. watch. Crazy. Uh, and learned a ton watching that thing on some behavior. That's some secret stuff that's for another podcast. But uh, <laughs> yeah, just watch, uh, just some of the behavior aspects of what they do when they're doing that was uh, a really cool experience. I think they're fun to catch. Uh, I, they always trick me. I always think I'm catching a big walleye until until they fight them for a little bit. And then you can tell that there's a difference there. But when you're fishing for walleye and you catch a burbot, sometimes it's a little disappointing, but they're still fun to catch because they are tend to be good fighters and bigger fish. And I think they just look cool. I just think the coloration on them and the, what would you call the vent ventriculation? Would that be the right word for it? That's a big word. I don't even know what that word means. I know in lake trout, they've got the lines. I know eel pond have kind of the, some similar markings. Anyway, I, I think they look like pretty neat fish. And then just like the history of the oil, like up on Lake of the Woods, the oil that they used to take uh, from yeah. these fish in medicine. Liver, liver oils. Yeah. Isn't it? Yep. Pretty neat, pretty neat fish anyway. Uh, so if you guys aren't targeting burbot as much right now, what have you guys been fishing for lately? Yes. 
<laughs> hey, really, I, I've been chasing everything. Everything. Uh, kind of interesting. Last week, we had some pretty interesting weather with temperatures down to it. I mean, I have a picture on my truck of negative 40, and uh, we got 22 inches of snow all within yeah. a couple of days. I had guide clients here from Missouri. Oh, boy. So, so you're talking about a 100-degree temperature differential, and they are all in it. Uh, they they came up and ice fish the first time in 2018. They just love it. That after that first time they went, they had me buy them ice armor suits and boots, and so they're geared up for it. Um, but boy, talk about troopers when you know when you hit that negative, you know, 30, 40 degrees, and they still want to go out. That's dedication. But we've that's been chasing uh, panfish, pike, walleye. Uh, we have fished burbs. We we went over to Leech together with with those with clients. Missouri, yeah, yeah, Jason invited me with. That's and awesome. That was, when you that, get people from the that's, the, right. that's the one. Yeah. When you get people from the south like that, I remember when I, I've taken taken hunting trips down south, Missouri, Arkansas, Kansas, or whatever, and you start telling them that yeah, we drive out on ice, and they just start to look at you funny just a little bit. So yeah. that that's pretty cool to get people uh, into it that are from the south like that. And that yeah, picture of yeah. forty it, it below. That Go night, ahead. that night when uh, when we were out there, we we didn't have great success, and part of the reason was we had a muskie under the fish house the entire time, <laughs> the entire night. Well, there's no other, we we would mark it on four different vexlars, and at different times, and sometimes other times, and there was no other explanation for it because it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't interference. It wasn't interference. When it's marking on the same deal, you know, we're only in, we were in 12 feet of water. Yeah. And that's our only explanation is it's got to be just a musky just laying halfway down and just, the, I'm going to live underneath this fish house. Perfect. <laughs> Man. So, tw- so that 40 below picture, I think that was, do you did the hot water, throwing the hot water up in the air in the pic, in the video too, in yeah, that same nice. post, right? Yeah. I think Dan might be able to find that. So. I was going to ask you how ice and or snow conditions have been. So maybe while Dan plays this video, he can tell us what, what the lakes are like up there. Well, it's kind of interesting because we got a lot of snow, but it's really, really light. So, um, you know, we don't have a ton of water on the ice, but there's some. Um, you're still able to drive around a lot of places with trucks, but I also don't recommend it because... You know, you take one truck out and it does just fine. You take another truck out and now you're buried. So yeah. don't blame me. But the, the big thing with going out anytime in the winter, you always have a shovel. You always have a jerk strap because, you know, you're going to get hung up at some point out on the lake. And, uh, you know, I've learned over the years that even if you have two people going fishing, take two vehicles, take two trucks. It makes it so much easier than trying to take one out you know, together, right. just put that, put that toe strap on there and yank them out. It's, it's just so crazy to me because like the Northern half of Minnesota has got so much snow and it's been so cold, but the Southern half of Minnesota, we've been pretty cold down here too, but we just don't have the snow. Like we got, we got trucks and tandem axles out on the lake, uh, some of the lakes, of course, and uh, what, 16 inches of ice or something like that. So we've, uh, that snow, man, that's a killer when you get that much snow up there like that. Well, we, we actually only have 15 or 16 inches of ice here. You know, if you get up to like Red Lake, even in the Bemidji area, you get a few more inches. Um, but it's a, the snow is a necessity for us because for our tourism, snowmobiling is such a huge thing. Even sure. cross country skiing, that outdoor aspect of it, of the economy is so big when we don't have snow, it really puts a pinch on some of these businesses. So we want snow, but- Just later. Right. Let's build, let us get, yeah, let's just, get a bunch of ice first. Yeah, yeah. You guys, uh, I think, was it Fargo? You guys did a seminar together over there, fishing seminar. Was it the Fargo show this year? Have you guys have you guys done them together like that before? And what was what was this one about? Have we done one before? Did we? Well, do, well, I, St. Paul, we kind of. You just had me come along for the ride. We did, but it was virtually the same one. It was, yeah, it's pretty. Pretty. We similar. called Jason. Jason named it panfish to burbot and bluegills to burbot. Bluegills to burbot. We talked about bluegills for about four seconds and then just went right into <laughs> eels. He says, 
I said, well, Jason, how do you like to fish for panfish for, for bluegill? And he goes, I like to use a tungsten jig and uh, some light line and, uh, you know, maybe a waxer or maybe some plastic. And that's how I catch bluegills. So let's talk bourbon. <laughs> that was it. Yep. You can watch it online. It's pretty sure, you know, it's pretty brief, a brief conversation about panfish. It was kind of a brief conversation about Yopa. We kind of talked about nonsense for most of it. We didn't have, you know, it was online and they were putting it over the speaker, but we only had about four or five people in attendance. And I think we knew most of them. So we were able to get Joel Nelson up on the stage and interview him a little bit. And we, as, as Jason spoke to earlier, we sure like to make, uh, make people smile and get them laughing and put us on stage. You asked for it. Well, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, if you go online though and look at that video, it's gone viral, at least small town viral. There's like eight views. <laughs> <laughs> you guys hit the big time. I haven't even watched it. I should get, I can get us up to nine. <laughs> I get my well, auto watch. <laughs> You guys have another, uh, by the time this airs, you guys will have done another online video, this one for Clam, a Facebook Live, which you guys are actually, the day we're recording this interview, you're doing it here in a couple hours tonight. What do you guys have planned for that uh, that Facebook Live? Probably not the newlywed game. <laughs> that was really good. Well, we're going to, we're going to, the, the, the cool thing about doing the Facebook Live with Clam and they do it every Wednesday throughout the, the ice season, and they have different pros that come on. Is It's very, very interactive, so people that are watching are just constantly asking questions. You can't answer them fast enough. So we, we could have an agenda of what we want to talk about, and it would be difficult to get to that. But you talk about a great way to get information, you know, and even though we're doing this uh, tonight, and you can always find it, online on uh, the YouTubes afterwards. Yeah. But, uh, you know, like I say, we have all of these great clam pros that come on there, men and women who are, are great anglers, who have a lot of good insight. Probably better fishermen and women than we are. <laughs> oh, for sure. 100%. <laughs> should, should, we, uh, should we take over the, so they can just type questions for you in the chat tonight? Is that how it's gonna work? Should we yeah. put in some, new, We're some newly, playing, yeah, newlywood, newlywood question game. games <laughs> during their Facebook <laughs> Live yeah. tonight? I've got several text messages today from several people. Are you sure you want to share that and let me know you're going to be on? And they're threatening. <laughs> Empty threats are going out there. Well, the good thing is I already have 12 questions that I can ask them that you've already provided today. So glad I could help. Go my backup plan. <laughs> and I've already written the answers down. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I want to ask you one more question about Burbit and um, maybe this could have helped you guys when you had that musky under the, under the ice there. Do you, have you guys ever used a Burbit style bait to catch big fish? Because Sat like Savage makes some, I think 10 inch and 14 inch. Yeah, here's a video I did up in Saskatchewan a couple years ago and our lake trout up there just go bananas for these things. The, the pike too. But that's a that's lake not trout. A small blue one, is it? That's a, it's a ten incher. Uh, so that's a small. The smaller ones seem to work better for us because if you watch how this lake trout approaches this, they come up and actually eat it from the side. And well, I think what ends up happening on those bigger ones a lot of times is when they eat it from the side, they miss the hooks. So the smaller ones with the hooks, I think a little bit closer, we end up hooking up a little bit more because uh, it's interesting how they approach. And uh, he'll come back up and hook up here in just a second. But you'll see how he'll, he'll kind of come up and, and come, at the, come at it from the side, which is pretty interesting, yeah. I think. Well, we can actually one-up that. Not that we both use eel pout style baits very often, because I don't think you do. I, I jig with the smaller Savage one. And I, they make a pretty small one. I, it was at six, eight inches. They make oh, a blue my- one. I've used it for Lake Trout up in Canada before, the smaller one, and had some success. But we've actually used an eel pout for bait. <laughs> yeah. Not not in Minnesota. Now don't don't get everybody's feathers all ruffled and whatever. But up in Canada for lake trout, it, oh, it sure. wasn't luck. It was it was dead. But we had a twenty, I think it's twenty four, it either twenty two or twenty four inch eel pout on a quick strike rig oh, for sure. eel pout and uh, or for sorry for lake trout, and it went off. What did it go off twice? And we never got the fish. But it was just a couple of days after that they got what, like a forty incher, on that same dead eel pout. Same dead eel pout. Yeah, after we had left. Well, we've pulled a lot of 
uh, dead eel pout out of the mouths of lake trout and pike that we've caught up there. So it's uh, it's definitely a, a popular forage for those big fish. Um, and speaking of forage for humans, I got to ask you a fish taco question because I got in an argument with a buddy of mine the other day about tacos. And this is actually more about uh, meat tacos and what goes in a taco. So I make pheasant and goose tacos all the time. And I'm not really a huge fan of lettuce. So I don't usually put lettuce on my tacos. So generally my tacos are, you know, some sort of tortilla shell. I usually do a soft taco. Uh, The meat, some cheese, and some taco sauce. Now, everything else to me just gets in the way. I'm the meat and cheese, what else do you need, right? Well, my buddy argues with me that that's not a real taco. And I want to get your professional opinions. You could substitute fish for the meat, for the protein if you want. But what makes it a real taco you mind if i start yeah why don't you interject uh, i'm in the food business so i'm talking to chefs all the time and i'm a regional sales manager for a rice company um your taco is a very midwestern white cotton panty taco <laughs> um that's all right i like those too and It's a taco and to each their own. If that's my taco, I'm putting everything on it except black olives. I want onion, I want jalapenos, I want taco sauce. Tomatoes. Tomatoes, the meats, probably some more peppers, some more meats. But not rice. Um, That makes it a burrito, burrito. doesn't it? Yeah. And a burrito, it might. Cilantro. I think I'm a cilantro fan. Yeah. I think cilantro makes a good time. I would add cilantro, um, but I, I I get beat up over my my tacos. But if you go to any of the fast food Mexican restaurants and order a taco, what are they? It's meat, cheese, and lettuce and sauce, right? So has Taco John's been lying to us all these years? I well, you get you get what you pay for. I think a taco is whatever you want it to be. If you I like if you say answer. it's a taco, it's a taco. Yeah, I think All right. it's, you don't have that's to. the nice thing about tacos. When you make them at home, you lay out yeah. ingredients or you have like a taco bar, right? It's like a like a Bloody Mary bar. You put what you want in it. It doesn't have to come to blows over tacos. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think your tacos sound super boring, Brett, but that's what <laughs> it's definitely super boring, but it's good. And that's all that matters. All right. Uh, the Jason's Jason Durham, go fish guide service, uh, Jason Rylander, North country guide service. And Jason, you in harvest, what, what you, you keep saying you're a rice guy. What, what's your real job? That, uh, yeah, that is my real job. I sell rice. There's a, even a comedy bit about it on the internet. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a company out of Bemidji called In Harvest uh, Rice and Grains. Uh, we sell, I sell the restaurants and to, to, to distribution. We don't have like a, a retail brand. You won't see us in the grocery store. So okay. I'm selling, I'm selling chefs. You'll find our product in uh, the restaurants you go to, fine dining and the like. Well, I had yes. a question I yes. wanted to ask for Blender about the rice thing because, you know, he has had this picture a few pictures that have uh, been very popular with ice fishing recently he was on the cover of the in fisherman ice issue oh yeah um you know he's, yeah. he's big time super big time but have you ever been on the cover of a rice magazine i have not have made <laughs> well, you haven't made the sure. cover yet has he made the but cover the really put- they only put food on the cover of those kind of magazines. They never yeah. put people. You're a good example of somebody who likes to eat. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, how better to sell a food product than show somebody that's been enjoying that food for a long time? You never trust a skinny chef. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right, guys. Well, tell people how we can uh, reach your various guides. If, if people want to go out and have you guide them, uh, how, how can we reach you guys or how can they reach you? Well, you can find me uh, online on, on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. Of course, if you just Google Go Fish Guide Service, it's going to come up. Or even just Park Rapids Area Fishing Guides. Um, and then, of course, Jason is on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Romper, Feeder, <laughs> uh, Sticker, Snorter, and MySpace. <laughs> I'll check out yeah. your MySpace page for sure. <laughs> yeah. Matt's going to be mad at you. 
<laughs> Northcountryguides.com is probably the best way to line something up with Matt. Um, or you can reach me direct. Uh, Facebook's a great way. and uh, Yeah, right there. We've got a contact right there. I've been guiding for Matt for, shoot, 10 years or more now. And uh, we got a good thing going. He does more of the winter stuff. I just don't have the time or the energy to guide much in the winter. I kind of take that to fish myself. But summertime, I'm always happy to get people out in the boat. So. And I will add, Brett, that I'm super excited because 2022, uh, Go Fish Guide Service is celebrating their 30th year. No kidding. Which makes it super old. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I was 11. <laughs> wow. Well, hey, man, that's congratulations. That's pretty good. Thank and you. the guy business is tough. So when you can say you've been making it 30 years, it's, it's I don't like to use the word grind, but it's a good, it's a grind. And uh, that's a, it's quite an accomplishment. And, you know, Jay Rye, I'm going to talk to your your rice company because they have we have a picture for the cover of the rice magazine. We've got a great photo that, I, that they wouldn't even have to pay for a photo shoot. Um, I'm waiting to see what this I don't is know now. What you're trying to cue at here? This one right here. Oh, now they're look at this. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was just the other day. I got a new shirt for Christmas, and I was trying it on in the garage there. Hey. There you go. Cover cover <laughs> model right there. Yeah, All right. Cool. Uh, <laughs> well, this has been a good time. Uh, gentlemen, I appreciate you uh, jumping on with us here from the Fish House. Good luck with the uh, Facebook Live tonight with, uh, with Clam. Uh, Jason Durham, Jason Rylander, thanks for being on the show. Appreciate thanks, it. Fellas. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to sportingjournalradio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to sportingjournalradio.com.